Good evening, Yimbies, partners, housing advocates, activists, and concerned Californians that want to see an end to our state's housing crisis. And with your help, we'll do just that. My name is Constantine Hatcher, Senior Director of Community Impact with California Yimby. And in, because of your efforts, talking to your neighbors and community members, meeting, calling, and sending letters to your legislatures and their staffs, calling into assembly and senate committees, making your voices heard loud and clear that we have seen major steps in the long road towards solving this crisis. And that dedication is why we have four transformative state bills in the final stretch towards landing on the governor's desk in September. And we have quite the lineup for you today. We're gonna to get started. I'm gonna give it just a couple minutes just to give folks a chance to log on. And then I'll, I'll kind of go over uh, all the amazing guests that we have today. Um, and then we'll just dive right in. Uh, there's going to be plenty of time for question and answer. So by all means, uh, type your questions in the chat box um, and folks will, will get those answered for you um, either live time or we'll have, we have folks working behind the scenes. Um, some, of, some, of our, uh, some of my esteemed colleagues are working in the back end to make sure that we get all the questions answered. And somehow we don't get your question answered today. We'll still try to capture it and make sure we follow up with you later. So we'll get started in just a couple of moments here. We're giving folks an opportunity to log on, um, but thank you so much for coming out and spending the evening with us today to uh, get some more information about this great uh, transformative bills that are going through the legislature. We'll get started in just about 30 seconds, 30 seconds or so. All right, so again, those of you who just joined that are coming in late, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have quite the lineup today to help understand the critical role each of these bills, these four bills that are that are moving towards the governor's desk, the, the role that they're gonna play in moving us towards a California that truly is for everyone. Um, we have esteemed assembly members, authors, we have bill sponsors and experts on the policy to walk us through each one of these transformative bills. Starting with Assembly Bill 2097, which eliminates parking mandates near high quality transit, we'll be joined by the author, Assembly Member Laura Friedman. Hey, Assembly Member, whose district includes Glendale, Burbank, and Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles, along with Michael Lane, policy director and co sponsor um, uh, of uh, San Francisco Barrier Planning and Urban Research Association, aka SPUR. That's a that's a, that's a lot of words. <laughs> um, to, to talk about, spur. <laughs> <laughs> right, just SPUR. Um, to talk about AB 2011, which gives by right approval for affordable housing on commercially zoned lands and for mixed income housing along commercial corridors, as long as the project meets spe specified affordability, labor, and environmental criteria. We have Derek Mazio, the political director of of uh, AB 2011 sponsors, Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters that represents carpenters ready to build housing in Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. Thanks for joining us, Derek. And uh, we'll be talking with our, our very own Graciela, uh, Graciela castillo Creams from Sacramento Advocates and former Deputy Legislative Affairs Secretary to Governor Jerry Brown, who has decades of experience wrestling with the state's toughest legislation. We're gonna keep the party rolling. Um, in our talking about AB 2873, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Affordable Housing Building, we'll have Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer, whose district includes Classic Central and South Los Angeles from Exposition Park and USC Go Trojans to Florence Firestone. And he'll also be joined by Alex Dawson, Senior Program Manager, and also AB 2873 sponsor, Local Initiative Support Corporation Los Angeles, that's LISC LA, whose scholarship led to this great opportunity. And lastly, rounding up our time today to discuss SB 886, the student housing bill, we get to hear from a chief advocate that actually will benefit from the bill, Zinan Uyate Crow, president of the Student Housing Coalition and UC Santa Cruz student. And so he's gonna talk about some of the great things that, are, that this bill will be for students. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to our AB 2011 moderator, uh, 
Jordan Paneha Carbajal, our legislative advocate. Jordan. Hey, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, when I start this, uh, my name is Jordan Parana Cabrahad, uh, legislative advocate for California Yimby, and I'm so excited to see everybody here and a great guest. Uh, thank you again, Samari Freeman and Michael Lane for making time to discuss AB 2097, uh, one of the bills that's almost there to the finish line. And I wanna kick it off with some questions. First, talk about the bill and some background for the folks who are not really familiar with it. So I'll first have to ask the first question. Can you briefly give the main features of AB 2097 and what the bill hopes to accomplish? Maybe I'll give that out to the Samaria Freeman. Hi, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me here uh, today. And I wanna thank everybody who's on here, not just for participating in this seminar today, but really for the advocacy that everyone is doing to help build more housing in California. Uh, it was so important to so many of our goals. Uh, and of course, to California Yimby for all of the work that you have done and what, the great partnership that we've had over the last few years. So this bill has been now a two-year effort on, on our part uh, to try to reform parking uh, mandates in California. And there's a variety of reasons for doing this. And what I've realized um, over after doing this for the last few years is that actually, in some ways, parking becomes the intersection of a lot of major issues of housing, which is the focus of this talk, but also in transportation goals and, and mobility goals, in climate goals, and in a lot of our equity goals. Um, it all becomes together in parking requirements, believe it or not. Um, and when you learn about land use and think about how important the way we use our land is, um, particularly in a constrained urban environment like we have in a lot of our California cities, you start to understand why devoting a lot of land and a lot of money and resources into parking cars uh, becomes problematic on a lot of levels. So what this legislation does is it removes um, some of the, the city's and municipalities ability to mandate a certain level of parking for developments near high quality transit. So high, qual high quality transit is defined by the bill are um, train stops, subway stops, light rail metro stops, and then major bus stops where you have several different buses basically coming together uh, in, in what, what you would consider to be a major um, transportation uh, hub. And within a half a mile of those in, in most areas, and it's more restrictive in some of our smaller jurisdictions, a city wouldn't be able to require any amount of parking for, uh, for developers. Now, unfortunately, we've had to take some amendments that limited uh, this scope when it comes to residential buildings, which are some of our most needed uh, uh, type of development is housing. Um, but now what the bill says is that if it's market rate housing, the bill only applies for 40 units and below buildings. And if there's affordable units, then there's a sliding scale of how much parking would be required. Um, so we tried to remove those requirements full stop for all residential developments with the understanding that developers will actually provide the parking that they think they really need for their clients, but also be able to offer um, uh, units with less parking or no parking or tandem parking or different types of parking for a lesser cost to people who don't require that parking. Because if you don't have a car, you're still gonna be paying for parking if there's a parking space in your building. And building parking is extremely expensive. So that's basically what the bill does. That was a long answer, I know, for a short uh, that, that was, Sorry about that. That was an excellent answer. <laughs> long, but it was, it was a good answer, it was an excellent answer. And I think that goes to my, my second question, which is, do you have an idea of how the removal of parking minimums will, will affect the construction, so, con, construction costs and destiny? Well, parking spaces for a standalone garage, and, and you know the statistics we have are a little bit old. I mean, construction costs have gone way up, way up. But the last statistics we have show the average parking space for sort of a single family residential or above, or above ground parking, I would say, to be anywhere between twenty-five and $35,000 per spot. Now for multifamily buildings that are usually building subterranean parking, usually with steel framing where they have to go underground, we're looking at $50,000 and up per spot you know, up to $80,000 per spot, you know, is, with some of the larger buildings. So it becomes very expensive. And of course that cost is passed directly on to the renters or to the buyers. Thank you. Um, my next question is gonna be around, um, are there any example of other states or cities that have removed parking minimums? And if so, what have we learned from those examples? 
Are these all for me or are they for other panelists as well? <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can pass the mic to Michael Lane from Spur. Sure. Well, of course, uh, great to be with you and, and grateful for California Ambi's friendship. And of course, we couldn't have a better champion for this policy than Simon Member Friedman. Uh, she's just relentless on this. And ironically, although everyone talks a good game around, you know, addressing climate change and low and lowering BMT, this is a really tough policy to deal with in the legislature, um, as we found, but it's really needed because those info sites are so difficult to develop. Oftentimes they're smaller. Uh, their odd sizes and yet that's exactly where we want to make those those key investments the bill also deals with commercial by the way and that's one of the reasons the california restaurant associations come onto the bill because it's also difficult for entrepreneurs who want to set up a storefront or a small restaurant or, or a taqueria or something like that and then they have to pay for if you know in lieu fees or to provide try to provide on-site parking as we saw during the pandemic, there are many better uses for the, many of that overparked kinds of uh, parking lots that we have. And this bill is going to help help to address that. In terms of other examples, obviously, we have other states, you know, city of Buffalo, we've, Minneapolis, um, Oregon, uh, but also in, in our own in our own state, California, city of San Diego, city of San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, Sacramento are all moving in this direction as well. Uh, because they understand this is all part of trying to undo many decades of, of of development that was really low intensity, sprawl, inefficient, and we need to reverse that. And if you don't deal with parking, you can't really do that. And we've got you know many studies out there that have demonstrated we're actually over parking tremendously. City of Berkeley had a study that showed that only about 40% of, of spaces are actually used. And as some member Friedman mentioned, yet those those tenants are still paying for those spaces because they're bundled and they come with the unit and that just seems unfair too. So we need to unbundle and reduce and really right size the parking. Uh, and we've got a lot of excess parking. So the, the idea that we're gonna to run out of spaces is just, that's not a, a real issue here. It's just that we have a misallocation of those spaces. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Michael, I wanna follow up with a question uh, on this. What are some of the main criticism of the policy and what will you say to those answers of those criticisms that you've heard um, for this bill? Yeah, it's just the overflow parking in the neighborhood. So we have to demonstrate how we can manage those, those types of issues. And uh, there are there are various you know, uh, transportation management kinds of programs that you can do to deal with, with, with street parking. But then also just the fact that we do have this misallocation of, of parking. And so a lot of the on-site parking is not being used. And yet that's why, and yet sometimes there are excessive use of street parking. So we just need to, to get it right instead of having each development bear the entire burden of providing all the parking and looked at shared parking models. The other thing I would say, there was some concern that reducing parking unilaterally would, would undermine state density bonus law. Mm -hmm. But we've also got uh, examples, including out of the city of San Diego, where actually eliminating parking minimums has actually increased affordable housing, increased use of density bonus in part because it makes marginal projects that otherwise wouldn't be feasible, able to go forward, particularly those smaller infill sites, uh, because they can use those uh, incentives and concessions for other types of, uh, of benefits for whether that's an increased height or reduced setbacks, et cetera. And then in addition to the, the reduced parking requirement. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to put this question uh, for both of y'all. Um, uh, for those watching, for those who are, you know, for those watching, what can we do to get AB 2097 to the finish line at this point in the process? What can people, the viewers, people who are tuning in, what can they do right now to making sure it goes to the finish line? Well, I'll say, first of all, there's been a lot of, of real concern over some of this from some of my colleagues. You know, to me, this bill really sums up everything I've been trying to work on for the past several years in the legislature, certainly um, making sure we have enough housing for people. And the shocking statistic is that in California, we devote about a thousand square feet of land for every car, but only 800 square feet of housing for every person. So how can we prioritize space for, for cars more than we do space for human beings? So it's a question of priorities, but if you care about climate change, you also want to make sure that we are weaning ourselves off of cars and onto more sustainable modes of transportation like mass transit. So this is also about, you know, answering the question of what do we do about all the cars and all the parking with how about we run more meaningful, convenient, safe mass transit in our cities and focus on that. Um, if you care about public health, 
then there's a question of getting people out of those cars and onto their feet or on bicycles and moving around their community better. If you care about air quality, it's the same issue. It's getting people again to use other forms of transportation that are more sustainable. If you care about equity, you know, we've got uh, cars are extremely expensive to, to operate. They're very expensive to insure. Gasoline is expensive. And even though it's come down a bit, that's not a trend that's going to continue for the rest of time. Uh, and um, giving people better options by having us as a state and having those municipalities invest in mass transit is really important. But we know that mass, mass transit doesn't work when you constantly invite people to park you know, easily everywhere. They, they drive. Right. I was just in Boston last week and I took the tea uh, everywhere and it was great. And I never once said, boy, I wish I was driving into downtown Boston in a car. And if I had done that, it would have been awful. You know, parking is like sixty dollars in downtown Boston a day. And but but they give you great public transportation. So you have better options. You know, it was air conditioned. It, it ran every like seven minutes. Um, and, you know, we can have that, but we have to prioritize that. You know, if you care about building community, well, we will respect each other more as a community if we can look each other in the eye. And you can't do that when you're constantly, you know, sheltered within your, your single passenger vehicle. Um, so getting people to where they're out using public transportation and walking, walking and biking through their communities. If you care about economic development, walking past storefronts is what makes people walk in and buy something, you know, or walk in and try a coffee shop they've never tried. It doesn't work if people are always driving everywhere. It's creating walkable, bikeable communities. And that can only be done by getting rid of these large open air parking lots, by taking that burden, like Michael said, off of small merchants of having to provide tons of parking every time they want to change use or open a shop. So there's a lot of reasons to do this. And what I would say, you're going back to your question about what you can do, whatever of those is important to you, whatever of those rings a bell with you personally, whatever you have a personal lived experience. You know, if you're somebody who rents an apartment cheaper because you only have one space or you have no space, if you're someone who doesn't own a car, let legislators know that. They don't seem to believe you exist. You know, when I talk to them, they say, but no one will ever not have a car. You know, no one will not ever have two cars. You know, it'll be Carmageddon, you know, parking again if, you know, anybody builds without parking. And we know it's not true. And cities can absolutely manage any, any impacts that happen. And they can manage it by using land better and investing more in mass transit. So for advocates, let people know that you want this, that you expect this, that this is the kind of city you want to live in. This is the kind of area you want to be in an area like this. Uh, if you're a, if somebody who owns a business, talk about how impactful it can be to not have to provide all those spaces, you know, or if you gave up your parking space for outdoor restaurant space and how great that's been for your community that you love going and eating outside on the sidewalk, you know, or in a parking space that's a better use of space than that parking space. The bill is right now in Senate appropriations. Uh, Anthony Portentino is the chair. Last year, the bill did not make it out of his committee. And I think he needs to hear from more people about how important this is. Uh, and there is really, you know, this is the only bill that's out there that, you know, that is really this all encompassing that that includes commercial space. And that really is about creating those walkable, bikeable centers around mass transit. And remember, this is only right adjacent to high quality transit, which we have invested billions of dollars in as a state. So let's make sure that investment works. So I, I think it's really important. It's my top priority bill and um, definitely need help because the bill did not survive last time. And it's really been hard getting it through each of its committees. Yeah, let's get those uh, fresh support letters into the Senate Appropriations Committee as soon as possible to register that, that support officially would be very helpful. Hey, thank you for that. And I think really wanna emphasize what you mentioned, Senator Freeman, the importance of talking to your legislator, the importance of calling in, sending in letters, everything they can do to make sure that you know, our voice you know, is heard in the, in the state cap and the legislature and to pass bills that is relevant to everybody, not just those who just drive cars as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, now I wanna go over to the Q&A portion, I'm sorry, the uh, audience portion. I already did my Q&A, the audience Q&A. Um, I got a first one from Adam, South, South Bay Yimby. He, he just really wants to thank you, Senator Member Freeman, for championing this bill. Uh, and he asks, or they ask, um, are they are there any particularly kind of particular kind of organizations you can use endorsements from at this process? Um, I think 
I would love to see the environmental community understand the importance to air quality, to, um, to sustainability, to creating the kind of world we want that's not so reliant on automobiles. Um, we certainly have had a lot of interest from the IMBI groups, you know, from the housing groups. Um, we've even had interest from some of the chambers have, have, you know, voice and it's great. It's always great to have a variety. You know, I love sort of confusing people when you get, you know, Sierra Club and the Cal and Cal Chamber, for instance, supporting a bill. Um, you know, when you could build those kinds of coalitions, you start to, to really address concerns of, of all the different legislators who, you know, who have the groups that they tend to respond to the most. So um, the environmental community has been a little bit slower to the table on this. They, they are out there, but, um, and I think the Dem Democratic Party, I think may have just weighed in in favor of the bill. And I have to double check on that, but we're just trying to build as big a coalition as we can for this. Um, uh, but it would be great to have even more of the mainstream environmental groups. It would be great to have more of the environmental justice groups, um, you know, be su supportive. And, you know, we've had some, we have had some legitimate concerns with some of our partners, uh, some of our labor partners, we've been trying to address those, but it's going to be hard to, to really address everything in the one bill. So you can always go back, you know, if there really are legitimate concerns, you know, we're always willing to go back and do legislation in, in subsequent years to make sure that we don't, um, you know, we don't cause any harm with what, what we do. Um, um, but also parking requirements can't be everything to everyone. They can't be you know, it's too important to remove these and to get the better land use patterns than it is to, you know, kind of use them to extract other things we want from builders and developers and businesses. You know, I think that's been something that's been tough for people. Uh, they see it as a giveaway, but, you know, a giveaway is something that just adds value to a developer, but I don't see it as a giveaway when you're, when you're reducing a harm. And I think there's actually a harm to providing all this parking near transit. And that's been a hard thing to make people understand that it's not like adding density, for instance, which certainly it helps with, with, with the amount of housing you have, but it really gives a big incentive to developers. Removing parking is not that big of an incentive. You know, it, it's, it's really something that will help the affordable housing people and the people building for the missing middle. It'll help commercial developers. But what we learned in San Diego is that the market rate developers, even without the parking mandates, still build a lot of parking because they want to be renting at a premium. So seeing this as purely something that is helpful to developers is not the right way to look at it. You also have to look at it as something that is causing a harm. It's hurting transit to have all this parking. So I would say, um, you know, building out groups that 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 really do capture all the facets of of what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Uh, really, you know, want to give um, at the end. We met at the end of our discussion, and want to really ask if any of y'all have any last comments or anything, last messages for our viewers regarding twenty ninety seven. Um, any last messages for anybody? Maybe, maybe Michael, you'd like to start? Yeah, let, let's finish strong. Let's let's register our support for this bill. This is really crucial to all the other good things we want to do around planning and, and climate change. And once again, grateful to Assembly Member Friedman for carrying the bill. Thank you so much, thank Michael. All of you. I want to thank everybody. Thanks for, for your help with this and all of the work that you do. Um, thank you. And my apologies, we do have one more just came in right now and I'm, I'm just gonna add this my apologies any too early um if that's okay with everybody mm -hmm. thank you uh there, we got a question that says have there been talks about merging ab 2097 with sb 1067 uh no um there really haven't been um uh uh I mean, we're certainly open to it, but I, I also feel like we've we've done a, we've taken a lot of concessions in this version of the bill, um, you know, more than I would have liked to. Uh, and every time we weaken the bill, um, it it kind of it hurts um, because I really do think that the bill is solve, is trying to solve something that's really a problem. And so we've done quite a bit, and I think that you know merging it would mean probably giving up a lot of things that are in the bill right now. So we're certainly open to it. I'm always open to taking on co-authors um, and we're not against it. I just don't know what that would look like. I, I wanna also say one other group that would be great to get more support from are sort of the neighborhood councils. 
you know, the city councils and neighborhood councils. We tend to get a lot of opposition to anything that takes away local control, as you all know, from local um, electeds and, uh, count and, and neighborhood council members. And it would be good to have more, more of those folks supporting. Thank you. And Thank HOAs you. as well, homeowners associations, those kinds of groups. Absolutely. Thank you, Assembly Member. Now, now I got a question for Michael. Uh, this is from Nick. He's, uh, they said, when I discuss reductions in parking minimums with friends in San Francisco, it makes sense to people. It makes sense to them. When I, when I discuss it with my people in LA, they freak out. How do you discuss parking minimums in more car-centric areas? Yeah, in some ways it's a chicken and egg problem, but it is a great question. Obviously, you have to have the robust transit and the built environment has to support it. And obviously, sprawl kind of suburbia doesn't always um, provide the best environment to do that. But at some point, you have to begin to reverse all of those, the, the building patterns and the development patterns over decades. And that takes time to do. And this is a relatively modest bill. Uh, as Limmer Friedman said, it's really targeted around our most robust transit service. Uh, and it's only a half mile in, in those areas. And that's the best place to start, actually, to really drive up that ridership and make it easier, particularly for those who don't want uh, to have to pay for parking or to own a car. It gives them a, a few opportunities now with the kind of a what we call the missing middle building typology, those smaller buildings and some mixed use buildings. And that's really the way to do this. The larger buildings can still throw density bonus, et cetera. Uh, for, for market rate development if, if they need to do that. And, and obviously, some of the Friedman said, developers still will provide some parking. And so there will be some tenants who want that and they should be able to have that option or find buildings that do. But this bill will not only not undermine that, it'll actually begin to turn that trend around uh, from the kind of sprawl, low intensity development that we've seen in Los Angeles and other places. And so this is exactly the targeted uh, and strategic way to, to begin that process without undermining, uh, you know, opportunities for people to be able to, to have a single occupancy vehicle if they need that uh, for commute purposes, et cetera. Thank you for that, Michael. Thank you. Well, now we have hit the, no, Constantine has his camera on. That means we're done now. But <laughs> really want to really want to thank Summary Freeman for making time today and Michael Lane from Spur for making time today for this great discussion in 2097 and informing everybody what's going on in state capital with this amazing bill. As mentioned, really, this bill right now, it's in Senate Appropriations, almost there before Senate floor, um, and we're getting closer to the finish line. So again, thank you so much, both of you, for making time and really appreciate the discussion. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Double Thanks down on that. Good. Appreciate y'all. Thank you so much for joining and making time for this space and for championing this great legislation. Awesome. All right. That was good stuff. Way to kick it off. I'm getting excited just hearing it. Um, now let's, we're going to kick it over to uh, Graciela castillo king Creams from Sacramento Advocates, who, who's going to talk with Derek Mazio. They're going to discuss Assembly Bill 2011. So I'm just going to take it away, give it to the experts, and let them do their thing. Thank you all so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As many of you are not new to housing, you've been part of these conversations before, and we've all been kind of frustrated over this is now the third year where we have not seen meaningful pieces of legislation move forward because unfortunately some of the conversations with labor have not gone as well. And so we're really excited this year that especially the carpenters have stepped up and have decided to that they needed to come in to the table with a solution and we're really excited about it. It's AB 2011 by Assemblywoman Buffy Wicks and it's also co-sponsored with the California Housing Consortium. So you basically have affordable housing advocates and labor champion saying, we need to fix housing, right? And so one of the things that is exciting about it, as we all know, when it comes to housing, the state has been focusing on it, has been providing a lot of additional funding. And so the question really becomes, how do we ensure that we have smart, thoughtful housing? How do we develop that? And how do we ensure that people in California have access to good paying jobs? And that's one of the reasons we're so excited at California EMB to actually talk about 2011. And Derek is gonna give us kind of the down, down low on all of the provisions of labor. But just really quickly, one of the things that I wanna highlight as to what the bill does very, for, for those of you um, that might not be familiar with the specifics of the legislation, it really overrides local zoning. It basically is looking around and saying, hey, we have a lot of underutilized commercial zoning, which is office, 
retail, parking lots that are out in commercial areas that are not being used, right? And COVID has exacerbated that. And so the question is, how do we utilize that land more efficiently? So it would automatically allow affordable housing, 100% affordable housing to be built. If you are mixed income project, then you have to provide a little bit of a public benefit as well. You have to make sure that at least 15% of the units are made affordable to low income. And the reason I want to make sure that people understand that, what we're saying is the market without state subsidies has to provide this affordable housing, right? So that's really important. And the other thing is all projects would have to pay prevailing wage. But I'm going to stop right there and actually hand it over to our labor expert because I'm not one. And he can walk us through the labor provisions of the bill. Thank you so much, Graciela. And thank you to uh, Constantine and Jordan for hosting uh, me here today. Uh, and thank you. It's so great to see so many uh, folks here. Uh, I'm going through the chat and seeing so many friends' names, new friends, old friends. Uh, so it's so wonderful to see so many folks active in this space. Uh, my name is Derek Mazio. I am the political director for the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters, uh, along with uh, my sister organization, the Northern California Carpenters. We represent uh, combined 80,000 plus workers in the Southwest United States, uh, majority of them uh, here in California. AB 2011 is the bill I'm gonna talk about today. But before I do that, I wanna just give a little bit of background on where we are in the labor market in California, what workers um, see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the construction field. And just as kind of a background of, of why we as the carpenters wanted to come forward and work with groups like Cal uh, to get AB 2011 introduced and hopefully across the finish line here in the next few weeks. So um, I'm a little biased. Uh, this, is, this is our bill, but I think one of the things to start off with is so, so great about AB 2011, as Gressler pointed out, it's the only current housing production bill that has the support of labor, market rate developers, affordable housing developers, environmental groups, business groups. It really is an all hands on deck approach because as everybody in this room knows, the housing crisis in California um, is out of control. Uh, we have to all come to the table. We're not gonna find perfect solutions, but we have to be uh, acknowledged with clear eyes uh, the situation that we're in. And, and part of that is the labor crisis um, that we see in the construction industry. So UC Berkeley did a, a study of every state's analysis of the construction sector. And what they found was that in California, a state that we like to hold up as one of the, the champions of workers' rights and labor standards, it found that about half of construction workers in California are at or below the poverty line. That's over 160,000 people who are working full-time, dangerous jobs, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, are living in poverty or, or, or worse. Um, half of them are enrolled in a public safety net program, and that alone costs taxpayers about $3 billion a year in welfare, food stamps, Medicaid, et cetera, right? So when we look at the rampant wage theft and labor abuses that we see reported, about one in six construction workers exist in the underground economy. And we know that those workers are disproportionately people of color, they're disproportionately immigrant communities, and they're disproportionately people who don't have legal access when their employer pays them in cash under the table or when their employer threatens to have them or a family member deported because they want to negotiate for better wages or for healthcare. We know that this goes on in the construction sector. Um, and at the same time, we know unquestionably we have a housing crisis. We're not building enough housing and enough of those workers who are building that housing, uh, too many of them are being pushed into poverty. And so we've had real honest and open conversations with many of the folks in the affordable housing community in the, the Gimby space to say, look, we all wanna build housing but we can't alleviate poverty if we're building an affordable housing project that maybe has 15 units, but it has 50 workers on that site and, 50, and 45 of them are making poverty wages because you're actually now making more folks need that affordable housing than units you're producing just with the construction of that project. So that's kind of the lens that we are looking through. As Graciela said, AB 2011, I think is a, is a a great bill. It's not a perfect bill, but it's an important bill. And it does uh, a couple key things, right? So overall, it's going to streamline and allow projects in underutilized commercial quarters to be built by right. Um, over the last really 20 years, but especially the last 10 years and the, and the last three years post-COVID, we have seen 
shopping malls, strip malls become more vacant and more vacant because of the move to e-commerce and the move uh, off of physical retail space. Um, what that's left with is these underutilized commercial corridors that too many cities aren't rezoning for housing. Right? We know that cities, because of Prop 13 and other reasons, have incentivized commercial zoning, which is important, but not when you have a mall that maybe has 10% occupancy and is sitting there and can be used for market rate and affordable housing. So what this bill did is it got together the carpenters on the labor side, the California Housing Consortium and other housing producers on the production side and said, look, we got to make it be easier to build housing in these commercial corridors, but let's do it in a way that doesn't leave out the 160,000 workers that are living in poverty that are working full-time jobs, right? So what this bill has is, is a few public interests requirements for a project to be built by right, which we know is a huge improvement um, for a developer, right? But it says, if you're gonna be able to build by right in a commercial corridor, you have to have a minimum 15% set aside for affordability and you have to be paying, paying with the prevailing wage and you have to be you, uh, ensuring your workers have healthcare and you have to at least attempt to make sure that some of those workers are coming from a state certified apprentice program. So as many workers as possible could be coming from the communities that the project is being built in. Now, I wanna be clear as the folks here know, right? Uh, labor is split on this bill, it's no secret, right? The Carpenters, we were one of the co-sponsors. We're proud to have support from groups like SCIU, of California School Employees Association, um, but there are groups, building trades and others who are opposed to the bill. And I think what folks uh, know or maybe are learning is that, um, you know, there are always, and, and I, I say this out of love and respect for my brothers and sisters in labor, but there are always going to be reasons, I think, to say no. There are always going to be holding out for folks who want higher labor standard or want higher affordability standards or who want changes to buy right um, with different situations. And, and we know that. We know that. Um, it's not going to please everybody. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to work towards building that housing and making sure that as many workers as possible building that housing are getting paid a prevailing wage, are insured health care, aren't being paid under the table, aren't being abused by labor traffickers or human traffickers, right? And so we know that this bill is not perfect by any means, but it is, it is critical, um, in streamlining that housing production to be built. So I think that's the, the main gist of it. I know I'm getting some questions coming in and, and I think uh, Graciela has more, um, but, but I'm happy to take any questions um, and talk a little bit more about the details if we wanna get into um, kind of how, how the bill works or just kind of on the political side of, of why the carpenters, you know, I think at our core, our members are 80,000 folks who are builders and they wanna build. And I think our core mission is to not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. And I think in this case, it's not just the good. I think it's the very, very good, if not the great, right? Uh, if not the perfect. Um, so I think we have a real opportunity here. As you heard from Michael and Assemblymember Friedman, this bill is in the same place, right? It is in uh, the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. Um, so for those of you um, who are thinking about doing um, some work for AB 2097, I'd ask the same thing, right? Letters in to Assemblymember Portin, or excuse me, Senator Portentino are critical, making sure your voices are heard um, in that committee to those members, um, as well as to the pro tem of the Senate, because we know how important leadership is in all of these conversations. Um, we were very proud to have Speaker Rendon's strong support for this bill in the first house, um, and we want to make sure that we bring it home here in the second house. So the, the, uh, the now is the optimum time, I think, for all of these bills, right? Uh, the first appropriations meeting is August 1st, is next week. So this is the week right now to be reaching out to those legislative leaders, um, particularly Senator Portantino, particularly the pro tem, and making sure that they hear directly from you about, um, yes, you want that housing in, in your backyards, and this is an opportunity to do it with good paying union labor. It's very rare we have a coalition like this where we have so many folks on the production side and the labor side united. Um, and so I think this bill, all the bills on our agenda are great today, but I think this bill in particular, really, if it succeeds, we'll send a message and say, look, the housing crisis has reached a point where we are all coming together, or at least many of us are coming together to find a solution. And if it doesn't succeed, I think it's gonna be that much harder uh, to really build these coalitions because 
um, there's just simply, I think, a certain point where we go, okay, what, what can pass if not this? So I think this is really a rubber hits the road moment. And so strongly encourage folks. I saw Rachel dropped a, a link here to call um, your state senator in support of the bill. Um, so I'd strongly encourage folks to get involved. And, and Graciela, I'll turn it over to you if you wanna start asking questions. Derek, you are an easy panelist. You were thorough. You answered a lot of the questions that I had. So I'm going to turn over to some of the audience questions okay. that we are receiving. Great. Um, and I actually have lots of labor questions for you. So yeah. one of the one of the questions by Evan is, what is the building trade opposition to 2011? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. And and you know I, we are the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. I want to just preface it by saying we are a building trade, but we are not in the building trades. Um, which is a little confusing for folks. We are, I believe we're the largest single individual trade, but we're not in the consortium of trades. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, I think we work very well together on a lot of issues. Um, we're often aligned at trying to make sure um, workers have the best wages and benefits possible and we're lifting people out of poverty. We have a difference of opinion on this bill. And the core difference that the building trades will tell you is that this um, project does not have the labor standards high enough to meet their uh, approval. Um, this bill has two, actually three really critical labor pieces. It has, it pays workers what's called, uh, a bill, projects built under this bill would pay workers um, a prevailing wage labor standard, which is kind of the gold standard of, of, of pay scale. Um, it would require workers to have health care. Uh, and it would also ensure uh, at least an attempt and a contract out to uh, have a state certified apprentice program. Um, that standard is not what the building trades would propose. They propose what's called a skilled and trained labor standard, which if we're the gold standard of labor standards, this is maybe the platinum standard. And, you know, I will just be blunt with this group. Um, the carpenters, we would love a perfect labor standard. We would love a platinum labor standard in every possible uh, line of work. And we often fight for skilled and trade labor standards, certainly in public works projects, absolutely. Um, but at the end of the day, number one, we have to be realistic about the politics and we have to be realistic about the ability for projects to still pencil out. Um, a skilled and trade labor standard for private sector housing is gonna be very, very difficult to build more housing, particularly in some of the less urban areas of this state. Um, where there just simply isn't the same type of labor force that there might be in a Los Angeles or, a, or in a, a Bay Area. Um, so we have to be clear eyed and honest with ourselves about what type of standards we can have in this industry. Um, and the carpenters made the decision to say, hey, look, um, a prevailing wage labor standard is, is great. It's not perfect, but it's great. And we have to be part of a coalition saying yes to some of these things. And the trade, you know, made a different decision, decided to say, hey, you know, we're going to hold out um, for, what I, like I said, the platinum standard. Um, and, and that's their right. Uh, they're certainly, I think, coming from it, a place of, of their, their concern for their workers. But I think for us, not only is it important to have a high labor standard in prevailing wage, but it's also important to grow the housing market, right? I would rather have 80% of our workers being union with thousands of projects built than 100% of a dozen projects built, right? It doesn't benefit workers if you are shrinking the market in order to increase market share, if that makes sense. And, you know, I wanna be honest too with this group, 95% of housing projects in California are built non-union. So that cash pay, that under the table um, project that, that disproportionately impacts immigrant communities, that's the most likely housing that you're gonna see built, particularly on single family homes. Um, so we have a real opportunity here to put in some of the best labor standards that this industry has ever seen. Um, and it has support from the builders, right? From, from uh, private sector um, developers and the affordable housing sector. So it's incredibly rare to have everybody kind of come together and say, hey, um, this is the time to come together and get something done. Again, the trades kind of made their own decision um, to, to not join that coalition. Um, but the vast majority of folks, I think in this space have decided, hey, this is this is the way to get things done. Great, and, and Derek, I'm telling you, I'm getting some comments on, on um, our chat here saying, thank you for joining the housing team. We're excited sure. to have you. And in this partnership, I think we're very thrilled about potential, potential yeah work that we're gonna be all doing together. Yeah. One of the questions that I'm getting, I, and I think you kind of started to allude to it, 
in terms of there's always a concern, right? How do, how do you ensure that the actual projects cancel out? If yep. we're going to, because especially on the mixed income where we're asking the market to step up and help on yep. the affordability side, what is, what is your response to, um, this is a question from Jason, when you're looking at some of the uh, other provisions of the bill, when it talks about prevailing wage and apprenticeship programs, what do you think and what are you hearing about? Are we, are we confident that some of these standards are going to pencil out at the end of the day? Yeah. Uh, a great question from my former colleague, Jason. Uh, it's great to see you again, Jason. Uh, yes, I think one of the strongest cases for this bill, certainly I can give you um, all the pitch from a labor perspective as to why this bill is good. But at the end of the day, I think the California Conference uh, of Carpenters is one thing. It's the California Housing Consortium. It's the builders. Um, it's the infill developers who are saying, yes, these projects can still pencil out those are the folks that I think it's so important to have both of their voices. Um, you know, the carpenters, I think, are an interesting um, breed. I've, I've been with the union now for about three years as their political director. Our policy shop is an organization called the Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee. It's a mouthful. and it, it, We call it Quad C because it's four Cs. And they're really the folks who work hand in hand. The Northern California Carpenters have a similar organization. They work hand in hand with us to develop these type of policies, whether it's the state level or the local level. It's not exclusively funded by labor. It's funded by a combination of, of contractors and the labor side. So we know if we're going to pitch legislation, we still have to make sure projects pencil out. You know, we could ask uh, as a labor union and say, we want the highest standards and, and benefits possible. But if it means the project doesn't pencil out, it means our members don't work right? No sense in what, what are, we like to call, no sense in fighting for the, the highest, unemployed car, uh, uh, highest unemployed carpenter. Um, and so, you know, we have worked hand in hand with the contractors, with the builders, with the California Housing Consortium to find um, standards, um, both on the labor side and, you know, carrots on the development side with buy right to make sure that projects pencil out, but also that they pencil out more than they would in the status quo, right? Because we can't just make sure projects just pencil out. We have to make sure we're building more housing than we currently are. And I think that's one of the critical points of buy right, right? Being able to build buy right is, is such an incentive for a developer. Um, it, it, is, it is really the, you know, the key that makes this work. And when we have, um, just enormous. I mean, I can tell you not far from me, right? In, in, in Northeast LA, I could name you half a dozen severely underutilized commercial corridors that would benefit from this bill. Um, there are, so I don't want to say surplus, but there are significant opportunities for development um, that contractors and developers are saying, hey, even with prevailing wage, with healthcare and 15% set aside for affordability, this project absolutely is going to pencil out. Well, thank you so much, Derek. I think that is, gives us um, a bit of a better understanding on the labor provisions. We're really excited. I think as the Assemblywoman was saying earlier, what we want to focus on when it comes to state policy is making sure that there's a lot of public benefit, right? And, and this bill does that. We're trying to produce additional affordable housing, more middle-income housing, and also increase basically not just the labor force, but also ensure that the people within the construction workforce are paid a decent wage. We want to make sure that they are not necessarily in the poverty level because that's that's a shame. So thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. I'm going to hand it over to Constantine. We're looking forward to uh, the fight that, that is coming for the next month. And so count us in. Hey, that was great. Thank you so much, Derek and Graciela. Just great discussion. And my favorite comment was welcome to the housing team. I love it. I love it. Perfect timing, Assembly Member. Now, we're as we as we move to uh, thank you, Derek. As we move to talk about our next bill up, AB twenty eight seventy three. Right on cue, Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer. Uh, thank you so much, Assembly Member, for joining us. Um, and uh, thank you so much for Alexandra Dawson from Lisk LA also to, to also help answer some questions around uh, AB twenty eight seventy three. Uh, Jordan, you're going to take the reins here. Take it away. Thank you all so much. Hello, Assemblymember John Sawyer. Hello, Alexandra from Lisk LA. Well, I'm so happy for y'all to join us today in a great discussion about leadership priorities. 
and the sponsor legislation AB 2873. Uh, really want to get straight to it <clears throat> right now, just you know, legislative update where 2873 is right now. Currently, the bill is in Senate appropriations, getting closer to the finish line, almost at the governor's desk. A few more hearings and floor sessions, and we should be there. So, again, I want to thank both of you for making time. And I'll, I'll pass up the first question to Senator John Sawyer. Um, actually, Senator, we can introduce yourself first, and, and then Alexandra, oh, okay. that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me. I'm Assembly Member Reggie Joan Sawyer. <clears throat> I represent South LA. I'm the 59th Assembly District, which will become the 57th Assembly District, which will also take in uh, Skid Row and Jordan Downs, Imperial uh, Gardens, and all of uh, the, the projects area. Um, I also have that little white island in the middle of our my district called the University of Southern California. So I represent a diverse span of different people, but most important, I, I represent people who don't have a lot, uh, don't have a lot of resources. Um, most of the people who live in my district are tenants. And there aren't a lot of people who own homes. And so it's really important um, for us to really try to get us involved in the affordable housing market. Um, I'm former um, director of real estate for the city of Los Angeles. I retired as director of real estate. I did mostly commercial real estate. I, uh, I was always afraid to do uh, housing. It was probably one of the most difficult things I could possibly get involved in. Um, but I knew a lot about it. Um, it became exciting to me when I was asked to take on this on this bill, but I, I guess the best way to to talk about it for me, um, I was I was at a a meeting, and someone that I really didn't know, um, a woman who considers herself an African American female housing developer, uh, started. I thought she was stalking me. She just kept following me around the room, and then I said, "Hey, how are you doing?" And she was almost in tears. She said, thank you. Thank you for your bill. Because finally, um, we have all these developers that are that are doing all of this, this work in this field. And a lot of them don't look like us. No one's even attempting to try to get people of color involved in it. And as we know, when we get people of, of color involved in any project, especially housing or building housing and affordable housing, guess who we hire? Other people of color. Guess who we hire? People from the area, from the district. Guess who we hire? Disadvantaged folk. And so um, it is so important that we, you know, we, we start to get this data because we got to prove that a part of the reason that we're probably struggling is we're not getting people who are most affected involved in this. And I, I, I firmly believe if you get um, African-American, Latino involved in this heavily, and you make us not just subs, but ultimately primes in, in the affordable housing market, um, I think things will go a lot faster because we're building it for ourselves. <laughs> we're building it for our people. We actually care. We actually want to get this done. Um, and it's not about profit. It's about doing the, the work that needs to be done. So. I was I was more than happy to do it, but she she made me feel like I you know you you go to Sacramento trying to do something that makes you feel good. I mean, just, we all do that. We brag about we're going to do this when we get to Sacramento. We're going to do that, but every once in a while there comes a bill that tells you that um, yeah, it was a good thing that you got elected, and it was a good thing that you're 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 here because you can make a difference. Thank thank you for sharing that story. That is true in the space of affordable housing, developing, I think diversifying the, you know, that field is always best, not only for California, but for a nation and get diversifying our beautiful country. So thank you so much, Senator, for sharing that. And really want to acknowledge that we have, um, California Yimby is a sponsor for 2873. We also have California Community Builders and we have LISC LA and we have a guest from LISC LA, uh -huh. Alexandra Dawson. A Alexandra, do you want me to refer you as Alex or Alexandra, either or words? Alex is fine. Yeah. Alex is fine. Thanks. Perfect. I'd like to give a, a quick, quick um, background about yourself, introduction. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me here today, first of all. And I'm honored to be uh, joining Assembly Member Joan Sawyer uh, talking about AB 2873 today. Um, LISC, uh, also known as Local Initiative Support Corporation, is a national nonprofit community development financial institution. Um, LISC LA collaborates with community organizations, private developers, and local government to invest in affordable housing, economic development, health and recreation, and capacity building. And we're really excited to be co-sponsoring AB 2873, which is a bill that would promote just growth for construction and professional services um, in firms owned by women and people of color. So I'll keep my introduction short because I know you have questions for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'll pitch up the first question to Assembly John Sawyer. Uh, can you brief, briefly uh, give us some detail what the main features are for AB 2873 for those who are, are on the call today? Um, let me see. How can I break this down in, into a nutshell? Um, it's like the California Tax Credit Allocation um, Committee uh, is, is looking at this. So we're looking at low income housing credit and women, uh, minority, disabled, and business um, uh, business employees for them to be able to um, get a, a sense of who is in this, who's who's actually in this market, and what this bill will will do. It will require housing sponsors that really receive all of this money. Um, I mean, we we put in a lot of money into to making this happen, and so what is going to require our housing sponsors that receive an allocation of uh, the low income tax credits, um, LIHTC, to report on the use of women, minority, disabled veterans and LGBTQ businesses, enterprises. Specifically, uh, this bill will control means of exercising the power uh, to, to, to make these decisions so that we start to get more of those, those individuals involved. Um, it encourages greater economic opportunity for, for women, minorities, disabled veterans and, and LGBT businesses. It clarifies and expands the LIHTC program for the procurement of, by affordable housing companies of technology, equipment, supplies, et cetera. And it requires a housing credit applicant and any of their subsidiaries and affiliates to annually submit a report, which is most important to the committee that includes um, several different factors. So we can get a, we can get a sense of, uh, of what, if there's, if there's any, a viable, um, detailed plan for increasing procurement for for um, minorities, uh, short and long term diversity goals and timetables, not quotas. Let me repeat that, <laughs> but not quotas because evidently that's a bad word. And I, like I like to say, the reason no one wanted to do affirmative action because they had quotas, and quotas would let you know what's really going on. So um, we're trying to find diversity guidelines, uh, diversity timetables, and goals. Uh, the proposed methods for increasing and encouraging um, prime contractors and awardees to engage um, in, in, in making sure that minorities are involved in subcontracts in all categories to provide contracting opportunities and um, requires the TCAC to consider the findings from the report submitted when establishing guidelines and really just a report back in 2023 to include its, in its annual report to legislature, a summary of the commitments made by the affordable housing companies to the goals specified in their progress toward meeting those goals. So um, I guess we're talking about a report card. I guess we're talking about, let's see what is actually being done, not what is, what is proposed to be done, but what is actually being done. Thank, thank you so much. As California legislators commit millions and millions of dollars to addressing the housing crisis, I think transparency of where those dollars are going, diversifying and making sure it has an equal playing field as well. So yeah, you can say it's like a report card for lots of folks here in the <laughs> state. <laughs> yeah, that, that it'll be interesting because I, I think the fear for a lot of people who have not been good, um, uh, have been not been good at this, I think the fear is um, it'll shine a light on an industry that really needed it shined on for 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 decades now. Short, 
Totally right. Uh, now I'm gonna thank you. And now I'm gonna ask Alex a question. Um, Alex, how does this bill help level the playing field for underserved communities in the affordable housing space? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that um, AB 2873 really gives developers the opportunity to evaluate how they can invest in underserved communities in other ways, aside from just you know building the affordable housing there. Um, you know, such as stable fair wage jobs, um, in addition to that affordable housing are really critical in uplifting low uh, income earning households. Um, additionally, in California, if the construction industry was as diverse as the state's population, communities of color could expect approximately or just over 32 billion in payroll investments alone. Um, this money is more likely to remain in these diverse communities as builders of color tend to employ workers of color at higher rates compared to their white counterparts. Um, and finally, when diverse firms build new construction projects in diverse neighborhoods, they're also more likely to take a people-centered approach that is mindful of how the project can benefit and uplift the surrounding community. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to pass the mic over back to Senator Jones. Sorry, I have one more question for you, Senator Member. Um, do you do you believe this bill will create any barriers to affordable housing development? Um, no. In fact, um, this may be for the first time. This will inject um, almost like a. a an ability to, to speed it up. Uh, I, I firmly believe that, that there are individuals that really, really want to get this job done. Because and, and again, when I talk about your heart is into it, that you wanna do it for the community, um, those individuals will work just as hard and just as fast to get it done. But also they're not in it to become rich. When, you, when you're in it so that you can you can go ahead and make a huge profit. That's part of why we can't get as many housing units out there because um, uh, everybody's taking a little piece of uh, what is going on and when we do the building. Uh, honestly, we believe if we were to dissect what it costs to, to build affordable housing and really look at the actual cost because when, when, when it's your money, when you're, if you're building your own home, if you had added all the add-ons in there, you would not build a home or you would eliminate all those different add-ons. And so um, this, this process, I think will start to flush out people who generally want to not only get this done, but want to get this done quickly because they live in the community and they can see the damage that's already been done by people living on the street, um, the unhoused, and they know that they have to get this done quickly. Thank you, same member. Thank you. And, and Alex, I got a question for you. Um, how, do you how do you see this bill contributing to the mitigation of the housing crisis? Yeah, so I see AB 2873 as both an effort to increase the number of affordable housing units and advance economic opportunity at the same time. If we're nurturing those diverse uh, development related suppliers and getting folks ready to enter into this industry as subcontractors, we're increasing the pool of firms that are crucial and ready to build affordable housing that we need. So our, I think our industry often relies on the same set of very busy and overworked suppliers or, or, or firms who um, understand how affordable development works. And if we're bringing more folks into that field, um, we are. We have greater capacity to meet the demand. Um, we absolutely need more hands on deck. So if we're if we're building out that field, especially with diverse contractors, um, I think we're succeeding at both um, further alleviating the housing crisis and building economic opportunity. Thank you, Alex. And, and for context, uh, for the folks. Uh, so a question regarding a CTAC, you know, the California Tax Allocation Committee, where is that located? That's actually under the treasurer's, um, state treasurer's Fiona Mall's jurisdiction. 
So it's, it's the treasurer's office oversees that program. And so, we'll, you know, all that data that's, as similar Jones saw about the report card will be going to Treasurer Ma, and it will be have more data to be published publicly. Uh, so we're now in the Q&A portion um, where audience were able to ask some questions. And I asked the first question for Summer John Sawyer from the Q&A. Um, they said, I see this bill is on suspense file. What does this mean? Oh, um, so there's a, a it, it's now going to what's called the appropriations. And what an appropriations committee does is look at the bill or any bill uh, from financial viability. Uh, how much will it cost then, and can you get it done? Um, so for example, if this bill were to cost a hundred billion dollars, it's opportunity to be able to get out of appropriations would be um, zero. Um, we know that um, because of the support of our treasurer, Fiona Ma, um, and, and her willingness to make this happen, um, the cost will be relatively small to, 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 to none. And she's going to, she's in fully support behind this. So we expect for it to get out of appropriations. Once it's out of appropriations, it will go directly to the Senate floor because it's already gone through our side of the house, it will, on the assembly side to go to the Senate floor. And then hopefully after that, directly to the governor's desk. Thank you that. Thank you for that, Assembly member. Um, and I want to ask another question from the Q and A, and this could be for e either of the panelists. I'd like to answer, it says, "How would this bill help provide more immediate housing assistance needed in areas such as Skid Row, where progress has been too slow?" Um, well, I, I can I can say personally, um, and again, I've just like I said before, I just now have Skid Row in my, my district. I've met with the, um, the, the providers that provide um, assistance to individuals that are on Skid Row. Um, many of them want to go ahead and start um, providing more housing, not only in the Skid Row area, but in the surrounding downtown area. Uh, they've been hampered um, because some of them are uh, minority or women owned or women centric or, 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 or minority centric and they have not been given the opportunity to expand or to be able to do this. I believe this bill will, will shine the light so that um, the, the other providers will, will either have them become subs, but as was said earlier, we can expand the pool. Um, we're, we're, we can't keep going to the same groups of people and expecting a different result. We need to expand the pool of people who, who ultimately are able to do this. What makes it so great is the people that are in Skid Row who are providing the services probably have a better idea of what infrastructure you need to build to be successful on Skid Row than anyone else. And so the, the, not only will it help expand the number, but I think the quality, the quality of the infrastructure will be immensely better. Thank you, Member. Uh, Alex, I see you uh, took off your mic. Would you like to add on? Well, what I was going to say is that I don't, I um, thank you for the question, by the way, from the audience member. I um, What I see this bill doing is um, lifting up some of the work that a lot of the nonprofit affordable housing developers are already doing themselves internally, which is taking a look at their procurement practices um, and really trying to get at how do they increase their diversity efforts and their um, hiring and their procurement within their organizations? So I think a lot of the organizations are already um, doing this work. And so this bill, I don't see it as slowing down or hindering the work that they're already doing, but uplifting it and potentially giving um, examples or peer learning for other developers who aren't quite, who don't quite know where to start. Um, and, and again, just to increasing the field of, and the capacity of subcontractors to do the work. Thank, thank you, Alex. Um, I got a follow-up question uh, for you or anybody that would like to answer. Uh, it says, who is, the report card, who is the report card filled by 
and manage and track by? Um, uh, the, go oh, ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that the report card would be coming from the developers themselves that are awarded tax credits through uh, the through TCAC, welcome housing tax credits, and then TCAC would be tracking the and keeping track of those report cards. I think the follow up was: was it be an, an onus or 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 barrier to administer to minority contractors? Did, that is not the purpose. It is is supposed to help them. So that that paperwork is not to be hoisted on them, but to, for for the larger developers. Absolutely, and really want to emphasize that uh, California is not the first state that has this. New York has a similar program. It has almost the same type of data collection and tracking. And so does the California Public Utilities does the same types of collecting and data collection when they, do, when they do their allocations as well. So this is not, not something new in California, nor in the nation, something that's already been successful in other parts of the state and in California in different departments. Well, with that said, you know, we're heading towards the end of the mark. I really want to give this space any, any final remarks for everybody tuning in, any last comments? Um, I just want to say stick with us. The, we're near the finish line. We're not there. <laughs> Anything can happen. Um, anybody could come in and try to uh, sabotage this, which is another thing that happens. Um, don't be surprised if somebody rears their ugly head because they don't want this to go through. They, they want to keep all the money to themselves and they may come out and say something. So I need you and everyone else on this on this call to be prepared to come in um, and support and uh, if we have to come to Sacramento and lobby to make sure this gets done. Thank you, Alex. Oh, uh, thank you for having me and uh, giving us space to talk about uh, the bill. We're really excited and um, I did see that somebody posted in the chat a link to um, reach out to your senators. Um, so please do that and uh, email and tell your, tell your partners to do the same. Well, th thank you so much again, Senator Jones, sorry for being a champion. This important issue, diversify and putting like an equal leveling field for everybody in the state of California. And shout out to LISC LA for being a great co-sponsor and California Community Builders being co-sponsored with us in California EMB on getting this bill to the finish line. Well, thank you again so much, everybody, for making time today. And I'll pass the mic back to our wonderful MC, Constantine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Assembly Member, for taking the mantle here. So important. Really appreciate you stepping out and, and, and championing this. It's been a true pleasure working with you here. And again, thanks for LA List. Their uh, scholarship on the issue really helped to drive the drive the need home. And so really appreciate that. Thank you again. We're going to have you again, Assembly Member. So I appreciate you first, but first time on with us. I'm happy to have yeah. you again. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. You're welcome. All right. So don't don't forget what it says in the chat. Rachel's putting those messages out there. Don't forget you got to call your senators or your, or your assembly members and make sure that they log log their support. Uh, we need you more now more than ever. We can't go to sleep behind the wheel. We got to drive this thing all the way through. Now we'll talk about bring up our our last exciting bill um, and to discuss our, our SB eight eight six. The conversation will be moderated by. Ryan Joy, our own Ryan Joy from California Yimby. And uh, really excited to have Zinan Zin Oyate Crow from the Student Housing Coalition uh, and really drive uh, this conversation home and why SB 886 is so incredibly important, especially for our young people as they're starting out in their pathways. We wanna support them all that we can and they shouldn't be worried about housing when they should be worried about those books, right? All right, Ryan, why don't you take it away, my man? Thank you so much, Constantine. And uh, thank you, Zenin, for joining. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Zenin and the Student Housing Coalition on this bill. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right into it. Um, so before I jump into my into my questions, I just kind of wanted to set the stage for this issue. Uh, one of the main charges of our organization is to expand access to California's abundant opportunities by making our state more affordable. And one of the keystone opportunities to the residents of our state and around the world are, is our public university system. Uh, the three arms of our higher education system, the, the UC, the CSU, and the community college system 
is not only one of the best economic, um, the best drivers of economic mobility in our state, uh, but it's one of the best drivers of economic mobility in the nation. Uh, and as we'll get into more in a minute, uh, one of the, the real barriers to entry into student success at our universities is the housing crisis. Um, so uh, before I jump into the questions, just to remind everyone, uh, please use the, the Q&A function to drop any questions in and I'll try to get to them at the end. Um, with that, uh, let's dive in. So Zenon, uh, could you start off by discussing like the scale of the housing crisis on our um, on our campuses. I'm sure as everyone knows, you know, there was a housing crisis in California, but what does it look like near, near our college campuses? Yeah, for sure. And thank you again for having me. So like you said, it's kind of a twofold question. A, it's about preserving access to opportunity for future generations of Californians, but also it's the present crisis at hand. So to start with the overview, Back in 1990, about 85% of freshman applicants to a UC were admitted. Last year, it was 65%. So over the past 20 years, we have admitted 20% fewer students than in the past. And this is because of a direct result of our UCs not expanding to meet the growing numbers of people applying. So that's the first part of it. And the second part of it is the crisis that we are facing currently. Uh, looking at the numbers, 5% of UC students, 11% of CSU, and 19% of community college students have all experienced homelessness in their past academic year, which is ridiculous. When you consider just higher education four-year institutions, which is UCs and CSUs, that comes out to 66,000 current students experiencing homelessness. And that's even more jarring for the community college system, which at 1.8 million total students means that 40,000, uh, actually uh, means that uh, over 1 million are experiencing housing insecurity as 60% of community college students have experienced housing insecurity in the past year. Thank you, yeah, that's, that's discussing the scale is, is really kind of jarring. And, and not only is it, is it blocking students from accessing our, our public university system, but it also leads to, to worse outcomes. Like if, if students are rent burdened and worried about housing, they can't focus on their schoolwork. Um, so yeah, it, it really is, a, 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 the scale of the issue is, is pretty astounding. So uh, what are some of the major barriers to creating more student housing and how would this bill, SB 886, help address some of those barriers? Yeah, for sure. So major barriers to student housing. So I'm currently wearing my banana slugs uh, jacket over here, um, made famous by uh, the movie. Um, and so essentially, the main things that focus, uh, make student housing so challenging is CEQA. It's the fact that our funding and construction is based on cyclical cycles where we have periods where we have enough money to fund student housing and we have periods where we do not have enough money to fund student housing. And the fact that the vast majority of student housing is done using debt financing. So it has always been the UC, CSU, community college responsibility for them to use student rents, so to say, to pay for current existing housing, but also expansion of that housing. And so there's not really been a large uh, step in by the state to help provide funding for the universities to build housing. And so when you look at UC Santa Cruz, um, it actually is insane how high the percentages of uh, our funds going to pay for housing end up going to just cover simple costs. So 20% of every $100 that you spend towards student housing just goes towards paying for new student housing. And another 28% on that, on top of that, actually just goes to paying back the debt that was created for that student housing. And so a lot of these things combine where student housing is very, very expensive to create because there's a lot of hurdles put in the way um, when it comes to trying to create more housing. And this leads to costs being extremely expensive, while at the same point, you don't have those structures in place that go ahead and allow for funding, statewide funding to come in to help generate those units. And so when we talk about a lot of this, uh, SB 886 really tackles the problem directly of CEQA, because the way that the process works currently um, is that you know, you have a very, you have a lot of different types of process that are only applied to the UC, CSU, community college systems due to their status as public agencies, which makes it 
extremely challenging for these institutions to create housing. And so SB 886 is coming in and saying, okay, you have a lot of layers where you're doing a lot of the same stuff over and over and over again. Let's eliminate one of those layers so we can at least shut off a, queue, a few years off of the timeline it currently takes for student housing to be built. For example, at uh, UCSC, there's a project called Student Housing West that was approved back in 2019, but still to this day is in a CEQA lawsuit and hasn't begun to broke ground, even as our student homelessness population has risen to 9% over that period. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and when we're talking about the, act, the, the barrier of CEQA, it's also helpful to contextualize like a lot of our universities, particularly the UCs, are in really expensive communities that have historically had a lot of opposition to new housing, namely Berkeley, Santa Cruz, Westwood, La Jolla. Um, and these are the communities where we see community groups and HOAs uh, using CEQA to try to block student housing. Um, so to, to, to get into the, the weeds of this, you know, al although CEQA is being, has been frequently misused uh, for superficial environmental reasons, the law does exist for a reason, right? Like it exists to prevent and mitigate environmental harms. Uh, how would SB 886 account for that and ensure that these developments are truly uh, sustainable? Yeah, and so, you know, we've been working on this bill for a long time, and it is some context of myself. So the reason I actually got involved in housing advocacy in the first place is because I personally had been evacuated from my child at home five years in a row because of climate change induced wildfires. And we kept on trying to move into the city, which is where I went to school, my parents went to work, and we couldn't afford anywhere. And it was ridiculous. And that's my perspective coming into all of this has always been from a climate change refugee and a climate change standard. And so when coming up with this bill, it was very, very clear to us in the beginning that we need to make sure that what we are doing here is furthering those goals, furthering to make sure that we are doing this environmentally stewardship way. And so to get into the details, um, universities right now across California are required to these, create these things called long range development plans, LRDPs. And these LRDPs are done every 15 years and are subject to CEQA. And in these CEQA documents, they have to list environmental mitigations, how much they're going to expand by, where they're going to expand by, and a whole bunch of different things relating to the law of CEQA and how they are going to mitigate those effects. But uniquely, in addition to having to do those LRDPs, for every single project a university carries out under those LRDPs, they have to prepare another CEQA report. And so essentially you're preparing another secret report that says a lot of the exact same things as the original long range development plan report, except it's a whole nother 700 page report, which as many of the people here know is available to be sued and appealed by local NIMBY residents uh, as has happened in Santa Cruz and actually over half of the UCs in the past decade. And so in essence, this is really about eliminating a duplicative process where we already know we have the mitigations in effect at the long range development plan level. And additionally, in the bill itself, we've made sure to include provisions where you can't build it in a very high fire severity zone, you can't build it in wetlands, you can't build it in other toxic waste sites. There's a lot of different requirements in there that say, okay, we're giving universities a tool here to make sure that they can tackle this insane crisis but we're making sure that it's happening in an environmentally stewardship way. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great summary. Um, and thank you for your, sharing your personal story about, uh, about being personally affected by uh, climate-induced wildfires. Um, I, I think it's, to, to add on to your point, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in this bill that ensures that these projects have to be sustainable. Namely, as you mentioned, they can't be in any sort of uh, like high fire risk area, uh, wetlands, anywhere that's really uh, environmentally uh, um, kind of could create some sort of environmental harm. Additionally, uh, the bill cannot emit, uh, the, the projects cannot emit any new carbon, meaning they need to be net zero. Uh, this is a direction that a lot of universities are going towards, ensuring that all of their projects are, um, are carbon neutral. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a hopefully a net positive on the environment. Um, as when we build more housing and allow students to live closer to campus, they're no longer commuting. Um, you know, they're no longer have to be forced out of, of Berkeley or, or Westwood or La Jolla, uh, and they can live closer to, to where they go to school and work. Um, so uh, last question here, and then we'll go over to, to any audience Q&A. Uh, what can our viewers do to support SB 886? 
to, to set some context here, this bill is also on the uh, assembly appropriations file, uh, suspense file. So we'll learn whether this gets passed on August 11th. Uh, but between now and then, what can our what can our viewers do? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming here because this shows you're involved. This shows you're activated. And, you know, as someone who's done a lot of organizing, this is how you build movement. This is how you build that power to pass bills like this. And so to do a plug for the rapid response team with California Yimby, that's been something that's been really instrumental for this bill. Um, we've been able to turn out a lot of people through that group uh, that are able to call into these committee hearings and really make clear to legislators just how important these priorities are and just how badly these crises are affecting us. And so that's another, that's a really great way to get involved. But another way to get involved is to show up for your university. If you live in a university town, if you live, if you are a student, you know, the ability for you to show up to a meeting and say yes to something in a place that has long been dominated by no is amazing because it uh, gives electeds the cover to make the choices, the right choices. And, you know, in Santa Cruz, we've had this happen where in our, just since the year of founding with the Student Housing Coalition, you know, we've gone to 800, 500 activists and we've managed to make a real impact because for the first time you're seeing a mobilization in favor of the university building more housing, in favor of the, you know, of the university in general. And so these things have been really beneficial. And for you personally, getting involved at the local meetings, getting involved with the rapid response team. And if you're a student yourself, feel free to reach out to me and start a student housing coalition type org of your own, because that's how we do it. It's grassroots organizing power that takes it all the way to the top. Shameless plug there, I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for, for, for outlining all the ways that everyone can get involved. Um, yeah, and, and thank you for joining us this evening. I also wanted to give a shout out and a thank you to the UC Student Association who has also uh, been leading on this bill with us. Uh, this really is a student run bill uh, we're just kind of, we're back here whispering in their ears and uh, trying to help get this bill across the finish line. So thank you, Zenin, and uh, thank you to everyone who takes action on this bill. And with that, Constantine, I will um, throw it back to you. Thank you, Zenin. I love, thank you for that plug on the rapid response team. Yes, I'll slide some to you later, man. Good job. I <laughs> know. Uh, or my developer kickbacks. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, thank you so much. Uh, just just having you, your insight and really um, impressiveness. Um, we we know the future is bright with with folks like you coming through our UC system and and, and young young people getting engaged and involved as well. Um, and just appreciate you joining us today and really shining light on this issue. Uh, it's going to be so important. And so uh, with that. Um, I'm going to echo Zinnin's great, great uh, pitch and push for us to um, to really to jump out and, and make sure that we're doing all we can to push great bills like SB 886 uh, through the last the last stretch here. Um, you know, get out in your communities, talk to your community members, talk to your neighbors. Um, uh, make sure Rachel's been dropping all the links for the call tools. Call your legislator. It's really easy. It takes just a little bit, take you about a minute, minute and a half to just click the link, go through the process and you, and it's done. Um, you know, join that rapid response team when we have those actions and activities to really keep, to move the needle and let, show up and show out for these bills that, that are gonna help make this, uh, our, our state truly for everybody, including our young people, including people of color and, 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 and neighborhoods that, that have been um, um, neglected, including our workers that have been that are enduring wage theft and all kinds of just uh, unfortunate practices, and then need a living wage. All of our workers, that the folks that that teach our kids, that fight our fires, that that patrol our streets, that um, that that deliver our deliver our our Uber Eats. So make sure that you show up, show out, keep the keep that energy going. Uh, we really appreciate you. I'm gonna, I I'm can't believe it. We're gonna let you go on time today, but please, please, please uh, stay engaged, stay involved, and let's keep winning this thing. We've done a lot so much together and we're gonna continue to do, do so much more. So let's get a quick flex of those Yimby muscles and let's go ahead and win this thing. Let's have a great closeout to this year and we're gonna pick back up and keep it going for next year. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Um, I'm sure I'll see you on some kind of call or something very soon. 
really appreciate you. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye now.